So we are going to, going to be doing a recap from round number seven today of the Tata Steel Masters Tournament. Sorry, thank you so much to Prince Little Spoon for the 50 gifted subs. Thank you to Chesscom DE for the raid with 107. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are going to be doing a recap today in round... Wait, okay, let's start over. <laughs> let's start over. Thank you so much to Prince Little Spoon for the 50 gifted. We are going to be doing a recap from the Tata Steel Masters round number seven today, the game between Andre Esapenko, the talented junior from Russia, and Anish Giri, the top player from the Netherlands. And Anish chooses to play D5. Now, there are many different... Oh, did I make a mistake? Is this round eight? Sorry, let's start over. All right, so welcome back, everybody. We are going to be doing a recap from round number eight of the Tata Steel Masters Chess Tournament. We're going to be looking at the game between Andre Esapenko and Anish Giri. So the game starts out E4 with E5 played here. Knight to F3, Knight to C6. And now Andre Esapenko plays Bishop C4. There are many options here, but Esapenko returns to his beloved Gucci piano rather than playing the Spanish. Now, it's worth noting that in the FIDE World Cup, about a, about nine months ago, Esapenko had great success. In fact, he won a couple of games with this against none other than the world champion, Magnus Carlsen. So bishop c4, knight of success played. Now we have d3, bishop to c5, c3, castles, castles, and Anish chooses to play d5. Now there are many different setups here. There's d5, there's also a6, there's also d6, but d5 is one of the most principled options here. And it is, in fact, a line that none other than the very strong American Grandmaster and five-time United States chess champion Hikaru Nakamura himself has played on many occasions. So we have d5 played here. E takes d5. Knight takes d5. And now rook to e1 is played. Bishop to g4. The idea, of course, develop the bishop. Pin the knight. White can no longer capture on e5. We have knight b to d2. Knight to b6. H3, Bishop to H5, and now Bishop B3 played by Esipenko. And now Anish chooses to take this pawn on D3 here. Again, once it, as I've said before, this is all pretty standard theory. That's why I don't have a whole lot to add thus far. Now we have Knight takes E5. Queen to F5 is played here, and now Knight E F3. And this is where there are a couple of options here. And Anish chooses to play this line with Rook F E8. Now it's worth noting that that uh, the, the former American chess champion Nakamura has played Bishop G6 on quite a few occasions. In fact, he played Bishop G6 and won a game against none other than Anish Giri in the Meltwater Chess Champions Tour final. So it's very interesting that Anish, probably based on his games against Nakamura, he chooses uh, to look at this line, but he comes up with a slightly different concept. So here he plays Rook F8, and now we get pawn, now we get pawn to G4, forking the queen and the bishop. However, after Bishop takes pawn, pawn takes. Queen takes g4, king h1. White is currently up a piece here. You see you have two bishops, two knights. Black has two knights and a bishop. However, having said that, you'll notice that a bunch of these pieces are undeveloped here. These, the, the queen, the bishop, the rook in particular are all in their original squares. So now we get knight to e5 played by Anish, knight to h2 here. Now, during the game, we were fortunate enough to have a brief guest appearance from none other than Aryan Tari, who is currently serving as the second for Anish Giri. And what he told us, assuming that his information was accurate, is that this is a line that Anish had looked at before, and then Aryan tried to look at work it a little bit more, make sure there were no holes in the preparation, and then Anish played it in this game. So knight to e5 is played, and now we get knight h2. White does not take the knight on e5 here, by the way. If you trade with the rook, for example, after queen to h3, king to g1, black can very simply make a draw with queen g3, king h1, not king f1, by the way, because then you would get checkmated on f2. King h1, and after queen h3, it's just very simply a draw. Now, in retrospect, I strongly suspect that if uh, if Esipenko had known what was going to happen in the game, he probably would have done this and made the draw. It's also worth noting that if white takes on e5, this actually also does not give black anything better than queen h3, king g1, queen g3, king h1, and now black simply plays queen h3, and we get a repetition this way as well. So Esipenko here chooses to play the move knight to h2, and now we have queen to g6 played by Anish. The idea is that you guard the f7 pawn. Additionally, you now have knight to d3, threatening to fork the queen and the king on h1 and d1. Bishop to c2 is played by Esipenko here. And now we have knight to d3. Bishop takes d3. Queen takes d3. And on first glance, it feels like white should be better. You've exchanged the bishop for the knight. And it feels like with one less piece on the board, your king should be pretty safe here. And now you just need to develop the rook and the bishop. And you can claim an advantage. However, it's easier said than done. 
So here, Estepenko plays knight to f3. Now, again, with the computer to, to aid us in our in, in our analysis of this game, the computer says that after knight d to f1, queen takes d1, rook takes d1, bishop takes f2. The very strange idea of b3 followed by bishop b2 and c4 is actually just better for white here. Again, in over-the-board practice, very, very difficult to find these ideas without the help of a computer. So Estepenko plays the much more natural looking move, which is knight d to f3. You develop this way. Knight looks more active on, on f3. It also guards the knight on h2. However, after queen takes d1, rook takes d1, black now captures the pawn on f2, and black has three pawns here on the king's side for this lone knight on h2. And there, you'll also notice that when we look at this position after bishop f4, c6, there really are no weaknesses. All these pawns are very safe on the king's side. These pawns on the queen side are also very compact. So even though white has the extra knight here, it's not easy to target these black pawns. So now we get rook to d2, which I think in retrospect is a start of kind of going wrong. To me, it seems more, more realistic to go for something like knight g4. Try to keep all the minor pieces on the board because after rook to d2, bishop e3 and trades, I already start to feel... That it's going to be very very hard for white to win this game white has the knight on h2 for the three pawns but again long term these pawns on the king's side they can start to actually march up the board and you can get into serious trouble especially as your knights are super far away from ever attacking the pawns on the queen side here so now we have knight to d4 by Esipenko with the idea of playing knight to f5 here to try and hit the pawn on g7 maybe rook g1 as well or rook g2 trying to put a lot of threats towards the king's side so now we have knight to c4 being played by Esipenko being played by Anish, I should say, rook to f2, rook a e8, rook a f1, and now knight to d6. Very, very logical by Anish. You bring the knight back to d6, you can jump to e4 and maybe fork on g3. You also stop white from putting the knight on f5. And the main reason that this is already starting to get a little bit tricky for white is again, these three pawns right now on the king's side, they aren't doing anything at the moment, but long term, they can start to march up the board. So we get knight f5 here by, by Asapenko trade and now f6 by a niche and again at this point in the game I, th I think it's really important that we start to take stock of the situation white has a knight for the three pawns on the king side nothing is really happening on the queen side though so long term you have to be very very careful that these pawns don't start rolling especially seeing as they are not weak whatsoever even if you get a move like knight g4 say i go rookie one you still can't really attack these pawns and there there are serious long-term threats so after king g2 is played by Esipenko here we have the move king f7 by Anish, rook to d1, trying to take the center of the board. And here Anish plays a very interesting move. He chooses to play this move pawn to h5. Now, it's worth noting that in this position, rook to e2, rook f2, g5 is one idea that's very, very interesting here. But it's also worth noting that at this point after h5, white has a very tough decision here. White has to decide, does he want to take the pawn at h5 or not? And one thing, again, not to sing, not not to make everybody think that I'm the biggest Magnus Carlsen fanboy ever, but one thing at the top level that's really important when you're playing the game is objectivity. And objectivity is really important because in a position like this, you there are moments during the game when you have to decide whether you want to try to play on, whether you want to simplify and make the draw. How do you come to those conclusions? Now, in this position, the correct move to play is rook takes h5. And there's one very simple reason for that. When we take stock of the position, all these pawns on the queen side for both players are not really doing a whole lot. But as I said before, there's a lot of danger on the king side. If black can start to get these pawns rolling, this knight is actually going to have problems um, obtaining any outposts. For example, say you get rook f2 g5. The only outpost that you can get here is putting the knight maybe on f5. But even if you get some position where I make some random moves, this still is not a true outpost because I can go rook e5 and remove the knight. So again, at this point in the game after h5, if I had been playing this game with white, what I would have done is I would have realized that if black has these pawns rolling, there's no chance of me winning this game. In fact, if I'm lucky, I'm going to be able to draw the game. So now we go in, now you have to also look at it from the perspective of risk reward. If black has these three pawns rolling on the king side, can you ever win? No. So if it wins out of the equation, the best you can hope for is a draw. And if, if you're very unlucky, you can actually lose the game. Maybe not even unlucky, but if the pawns just start rolling, you can just flat out lose the game. So what are we looking at? Best case scenario draw, worst case scenario loss. You have one good result, one bad result, only two results in play here. So if you only have two results in play here, you, you kind of need to realize that and bail out, especially against a strong player like Anish who has such, such good fundamentals. And that's why rook takes h5 would have been the best move because after rook to e2, king g3, rook takes b2, 
White can now play Rook D7 check, and after Rook E7, trade Rook A5, guarding the pawn A2 and hitting the pawn A7, A6, A6 here, and Knight to F3. And in this position, Black has two pawns on the king's side, but it's going to be very hard to advance them up the board here. And White can even go Knight D4, maybe Knight F5. Uh, if Rook C2, even Rook A3, followed by Rook B3, for example, say King F7, Rook B3, B5, Rook A3. And again, Black is completely fine. Black's in no danger of losing. But White, however, uh, is not in any danger of losing either here. So it's really important to take stock of the situation and be objective. Esopenko, however, does not remain objective here. And I'm not really sure whether he miscalculated something in Rook H5 or he just very simply forgot the danger once these pawns on the king side start rolling. So here he plays Rook to F2. Now it's worth noting also one other point. Rook D7 check is not a move here because after King to E6, you actually lose one of your two rooks here. You'd love to connect, but I take. And so you can't guard both of these rooks, which is why Rook to D7 is not a move here. So Rook to F2 is played here by Esopenko. And actually, someone in chat asked a good question, which is they say, why Rook E7 after Rook to D7? You don't have to play Rook E7, but if you go King E6, you lose the pawn on G7 here. If you go to F8, it's checkmate. If you go to G6, for example, here, White can play Rook H4 with the idea of Rook G4, and you're going to put a lot of pressure on the pawn on G7. And if you go King G8, which is the only other move here, again, White can play a move like Knight G4, and there's no check on E3 here. Your Rooks are very, very active. The King on G8 is a little bit loose, and there's a lot of danger here to deal with. So that's why Rook E7 is the best move, as, as I alluded to before. Anyway, we get back to the game. So Rook F2 is played here by Esopenko, and Anish correctly plays G5, and now he starts to launch the pawns on the king's side. And as you'll notice, this knight on H2, a knight is worth more than pawns generally, but here the knight has no targets. So there really are no squares for the knight to go to. You can't go to G4 here. And again, the pawns are really starting to march. So now we have Rook to D7 check. Rook 3 to E7 played by Anish. Again, Anish does not mind trading rooks because even though the knight is technically better than pawns, you have three pawns for the knight and with less pieces on the board, especially a position like this. Once black gets like rookie five and f5, f4, or h4, and g4, you're probably going to lose the game here. So we get rook to d6 here. Rook to e6 played by Anish. Check again. Rook, e, rook 8 to e7. And now rook to d8. Again, just logical play from Anish. He puts the rooks on the optimal squares. Again, the rook on e6 guards f6, and the rook on e7 guards b7, and also potentially the seventh rank here. So now we have this move g4 played by Anish, which actually is a very big mistake. And this is one of the few opportunities here in the end game where Anish, where, uh, sorry, not Anish, but where Andre Esopenko could have saved himself and avoided losing. And in this position, the reason g4 is a mistake is because after knight to f1 here, you're threatening to go knight g3 and knight f5 or even attack the pawn in h5. And after the move h4, you can play this move rook to h8, g3, and rook to f4. Now, again, this is very difficult to see, so I'm not like super critical of the way Esopenko played this because it does look very, very scary. Say rook to e2, king to g1, g2. You actually have knight to h2. Rook takes b2, knight f3, and you stop the checkmate on e1. The pawn on g2 is a little bit weak, and the pawn on h4 is going to be captured on the next move. So white is actually okay here. But again, it's very, very difficult, um, very, very difficult to play. Over the board, it looks really, really scary. So this is the one draw, which I would say I'm not, um, I don't think it's surprising that Esopenko missed. Although again, if he had used enough time, maybe he could have been able to calculate it. So we got this position here after G4, and now Esopenko plays Rook H8. And after King G6, the big problem here is that you cannot play Knight to F1 with the idea of Knight G3, because now I go Rook to E8, and I actually trap your Rook in the corner. So you have to trade the Rooks down and now after rook takes rook, I'm just going to go king g5, f5, f4, h4, h3. And these three pawns on the king side are worth a whole lot more than this pony on f1. So after king g6, Esopenko plays rook g8. We have rook to e7, rook to g7 played here. And now Esopenko goes rook f8. Again, trying to prevent Anish from pushing the f pawn. Because the, in an ideal world, you want to go like f5 and then h4. But if we look at this position after rook g7 rook f8 without the pawn going to f5 you can't actually push this pawn because you lose the pawn on g4 so you really need to get this pawn forward and right now the rooks on f2 and f8 prevent it so we get king g5 here and now knight to f1 played by andre h4 played by anish again very logical idea the king to g5 guard the pawn and now there is serious danger for white we have a4 here pawn to a5 b4 
B6. And when, when my co-commentator Benjamin Bach and I were doing our analysis of this earlier, we did note that it's a very strange situation here where both sides are kind of in a mutual Zugzwang. Now, those of you guys who speak German, you will understand that Zugzwang is a situation where neither side wants to make a move. Both players want it to be the opponent's turn here because whoever moves has to yield in some way. Now, the reason for that is because in, a, in an ideal world, say you move the rook to, let's just say, D8, Black can now start pushing F5, there's H3 or F4 next move, and all three of these pawns are marching down the board. So White really does not want to move either of these rooks because otherwise Black's going to get to push the pawn to F5. Additionally, you can't really move this knight. If you go to like D2, for example, now I can play G3. You kind of have to play knight F3. If you go rook F1, I have rook E2 check to win the game. And after knight F3, king G4, once you move the rook to, I'm going to say F1, now my pawns are really, really far up the board on H3 and G3, and you're going to lose the game very shortly. So white can't really move either of these rooks or this knight here. At the same time, let's just assume it's black's move, so I'm just going to get this position uh, with it being black's move here. Black really doesn't have many options either. You can't push the F pawn. If you push H3, I go king H2, and then I get a blockade on G3 here, and then your pawn, then you might even actually lose this game, in fact. So you don't really want to push h3 if you go g3 here for example i can actually i mean i guess this isn't terrible but i can just sack the knight and this end game even though black's an extra pawn on f6 should be a draw here especially because the pawns on the queen side are completely but the pawns are sort of weak for both sides here so you don't really want to push the g or the h pawns here if you're trying to win the game you can't push the f pawn either and you also can't really do a whole lot on the queen side in fact neither side really can do much here um as it is so you don't want to push the g or the h pawns you can't push the F pawn, so can you even move the Rook? Now, if you go like Rook E5, now you lose the pawn in F6. So you also can't really move the Rook. Um, and if you move your Rook from G7 to like D7, now I can just start checking again on G8 and H8, and this is a draw. So what we end up is, what we end up with a situation where both players really don't want to yield. Um, now, some of the chances can on each play Rook D6. Yes, Rook D6 is a move, um, but actually if you go Rook D6, I can even jump with my Knight to E3, and now there's Knight F5 or Rook F5. And again, this is kind of scary to play for Black. So as we get back to the game, it's important to note that that's the situation. This is where this is where Andre probably had the final opportunity to maybe salvage the game and make the draw. And this draw, I think, is a lot harder than the previous one, that whole Knight F1 line earlier, because now the way that he can draw this game is to go Rook to B8. Black plays F5 here. Idea to go F4 and H3. You have to go back to stop these pawns. Rook E5 guards the pawn. And now you can play the very strange move, which is King to H2. And someone in chat asked, what about Rook G6? You can always play Rook G6, but I can also just move my King back. And you still, whenever you move the Rook away, I just keep on checking on G8 and H8, and I'm completely fine. So this one is the last one. This is sort of the last moment where there was a chance. But again, for us humans, we are not computers. It's very hard to just sit and wait, especially with this avalanche of pawns marching up the board towards where my, my White King and my White Rook are. Um, so therefore, in this position, Andre takes, and he goes Rook A8. Anish plays rook e5, guards the pawn in a5, also prepares to push the pawn to f5. And now we have knight to d2, which is the final nail in the coffin, the, the big blunder of the game. It's worth noting once again, after rook to f8, f5, king to h2, there were still some drawing chances for Esipenko because of g3. Once again, you can sack and you can go into this end game where black has this extra f pawn, but there are pretty solid drawing chances here. And I suspect actually that with perfect play, this is still a draw. It's also worth noting that c4 is a move here, and it would have been interesting to see what Anish does. Uh, I suspect that Anish probably would have played c5, and we would have hit the Zugzwang button again. And now the last real try again is to go king h2, g2, and just sit on the position forever and, and wait until we get into this rook and pawn endgame. So this would have been really the last opportunity that, um, that Estepenko had. Instead, as I was saying earlier, we are humans at the end of the day. You want to do something active. It's very hard to sit and not have a plan. We're humans. We try to be logical. If you don't have a plan, you don't feel like you're human. You don't feel like you're doing something like something that makes a whole lot of sense. And that is the reason that Esipenko plays 92. He tries to be active. He cannot just sit on the position. Um, and that really makes him only human. So he plays 92. And now we get G3 played here by Anish. Perfect move, by the way. And after this, the game is losing. Because now if you move the rook away, just like in the earlier lines, there's rook to e2, hitting the king and the knight and winning the game. And after knight f3 check, black is a very nasty move king to f4. Because now when you capture the rook, I in between capture your rook, and it's actually a check on the king. 
So you have to take the pawn, and after pawn takes knight, rook takes a5, h3. Black has the peepos here, the e and the h pawns are somewhat split. I also have rook g2 at some point, and this is completely winning for black. So as we go back here, you can't really take the knight because you end up in a losing rook and pawn endgame. What Esipenko plays here is he plays the move rook f1. Now, you guys are asking, did Esipenko miss the pawn capture? I don't think that he missed the pawn capture. I think what Esipenko missed is that he spent a lot of time getting to this position, and the line that he calculated here was this move rook to e2. And after king to g1, I think he saw g2, rook f2, and he thought, I'm saving the game. After rook takes f2, king takes f2, let's just say h3, for example. White can go rook h8, and white is still okay here because the two pawns are sort of blockaded. Knight stops g1. You can't go h2 because I take with the rook. And... I suspect that Esipenko saw this line. He thought, you know what? After this g2, rook f2, I'm fine. If black tries to move like h3, I can even just go knight d4 check and rook f2, trade king f2, h2, rook h8, white's fine. Uh, if rook g2, king f1, rook a2, black can probably still draw this after king g1 and rook a4, but you are not losing. Very important to note. So in this position, Anish finds the winning line. And this is what I think Andre overlooked, which is this very tricky move pawn to h3. And... Again, from, from a distance, it's, it's kind of hard to see this move. I suspect after playing for nearly six hours, Andre probably just getting tired. Um, he's not super young, and he just overlooked this idea. So after h3, or actually, sorry, Andre is pretty young. That doesn't make any sense what I just said. Scrap that. Um, <laughs> that, that makes no sense at all. Okay, anyway, back to the game. After, after h3 is played, uh, if you go king g1 here, there's a very nice win. You can play pawn to g2. If knight takes rook check, again, you capture with check. And after king f1, f takes e5 is winning here for black. And if you move the rook to f2, which is the only other try, now you go king to g3. And if you take the rook, I actually can checkmate you with h2. King guards the pawns. King is stuck on g1. Game over. And if you play rook h8, which is the only way to kind of stop this trick. Actually, it's worth noting, let me play a random move like rook b8. There's the same trick with rook e1 check. Knight takes e1, h2 checkmate. So the only way to stop this is to play the move rook to h8. And now if h you can capture because your knight still guards the e1 square. So after rook h8, however, this is actually still lost because now black can go rook b7, threaten the checkmate on b1. And if you play rook to g8, the only check in the position, black can play the beautiful move rook to g5. If you capture with the knight, checkmate again. If you move the rook away, I just go, I just go, actually not rook d8. If you play rook e8, for example, I go rook b1, rook e1, trade h2 checkmate once again and if you play rook takes g5 the only other move after pawn takes again there's no way to stop rook b1 or h2 both of these both of these moves lead to a forced checkmate so therefore in this position andre takes on h3 and now anish goes g2 attacking the rook if you move the rook to say g1 i just take the knight and now i'm going to mate you with rook h5 next move and so he goes rook to f2 and now anish plays the beautiful finishing move which is king to e3 and after king to e3, this is this is game over. Andre resigns. In view of the fact that, let's say you take the rook here, I can just make a queen and you're getting checkmated on h1 or g3. And if you take the pawn on g2, which is the only logical move, I play the beautiful move, king takes knight. And now I'm attacking your rook on g2. If you move the rook away, for example, I can just go checkmate. And if you take the rook on g7, I have rook h5. Again, checkmate. King has no squares here. All the squares are covered by the black king on f3. And so in this position after king e3, Andre resigns because simply after takes and king f3, you have no way of stopping checkmate or losing the rook on g2. And Anish is far too strong of a player to, to give up that sort of advantage and he, he would have won. So very, very beautiful game by Anish. Played it extremely well. Probably his best game of the tournament so far. Very, very few mistakes. Maybe a couple chances for Andre that were missed. Um, but really to me, the story of the game is learn to be objective learn to be objective in positions understand where there are chances and where the chances kind of are gone and being able to step back and just make the draw if you have to which definitely occurs in this game in that position after h5 because as i said before when we had this move h5 that was played all the way back on move number 31 if andre just decided you know what i can't win the game anymore but i i'm unwilling to get take risks and lose the game he would have taken on h5 and made a draw probably pretty routinely but he didn't do that and on each to his credit he punishes andre very swiftly and wins his best game of the tournament in the tata steel masters so tomorrow is going to be a rest day but going into round nine is going to be very exciting we have a match between the leaders shakaram mamadiarov and 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 magnus carlson 
Now you have Vedit and Anish Giri who are both half point out of first place as well. So the tournament is only heating up as we head into the home stretch. 